What's up YouTube? It's your girl Morgan and I'm back here in the middle of the woods to tell you what I do for a living. So a lot of people like to ask like what do I actually do as an environmental scientist and it's kind of a complicated question because I do a lot for my position. Um, I'm within my, I just finished up my first year so I've worked at my company for a little bit over a year even though this is all new to me I've learned a lot over the year and I just wanted to share with you guys what exactly I do. So when people ask me what I do, I usually respond with glorified hiking because I never really feel like explaining what I do. There's just a lot that goes into what I do. So I work in um, impact assessment and permitting. So I do everything from erosion and sediment control inspections, wetland delineations, habitat assessments for threatened and endangered species, stream assessments. So there's just a lot. But today I'm gonna go over uh, wetland delineations, which is my favorite part of my job. It's what I started out really doing and just kind of what I enjoy doing when I have the opportunity. environmental scientist working in environmental consulting, I wear a lot of different hats. I'm a jack of all trades, you could say. So my job involves office and field work. Wetland delineations is specifically a type of field work that I do. So first we're going to start off with what is a wetland and why do we care? Okay, so due to section 404 of the Clean Water Act, water resources of the U.S. are regulated and that includes wetlands. So wetlands, you may imagine, are kind of swamps. I think when people think of wetlands, they think of swamps um, in addition to like marshes, but not all wetlands look like that. Wetlands just look vastly different. Um, there are forested wetlands, there are some wetlands that have more open water, which are the marshy ones you may be thinking about. There are some that have more shrubs in them. They just look vastly different. So there are characteristics we as environmental scientists or wetland delineators look at when we go out into the field to classify a wetland. So there are three specific characteristics or indicators we look into to really call a water feature a wetland. And those characteristics are hydrophytic vegetation, which is vegetation that likes to grow in wet areas, hydric soils, which are soils that you often see in an area that has water in it often, in addition to signs of hydrology, which basically means you can tell that there has been water in that area before. We use those three characteristics and indicators uh, within those characteristics to determine if something can be called a wetland. So prior to going out into the field, we do our research on the property. We look at several databases to tell us, you know, is there potentially a wetland in the area? We look at topography maps. We look at several databases that um, may give us hints to where wetlands are and we kind of get our idea of the site before we really get out there. So during a wetland delineation, basically we hike a lot. It's funny because people ask me what I do for a living and if I really don't care to tell them, I tell them I'm a glorified hiker, which is a super understatement of what I do but a huge part of my job is walking around in the woods all day. So when we're walking around looking for wetlands, there's certain features we're looking for that may hint to us and we'll go, wow, there's potentially a wetland over there. And that could be a sudden change in topography. Maybe there's like a bowl and there's, we, it looks like a lot of water would collect there. Sometimes it's a sudden change in vegetation. And that's generally what draws our attention to a specific area to look at first. So when we come across an area that we think may be a wetland, we'll start by taking soil samples. When we're looking at soils in a wetland delineation and we're walking around, we take our hand auger and we're basically boring a small hole of about 18 inches. And I'll lay those soils flat and I will texture and type those soils. So hydric soils have specific features. It is our job to typify the soils by color and texture. So we pull our soils, we then take our soil sample, and we'll compare the colors of the soil to the colors in a book that we have called a Munsell. So there's certain colors that are specific in wetlands, and soil colors can vary greatly in different regions. So soils in wetlands look distinctly different than soils in uplands. So wetland soils look different just due to the lack of oxygen. So microbes come into play, and I'm not gonna get super into this because I know you guys aren't that interested in this, but I can make a separate video if you hit the like button and comment that you want to hear about it. But basically, microbes in the soil need to survive off of other nutrients other than oxygen. Those microbes would take um, other nutrients and chemicals out of the soil since there's a lack of oxygen, and that causes the soil to change color in basic terms. 
for signs of hydrology, it could, sometimes it's, it's much more simple than that. Sometimes you look at leaf litter and it looks like it's been wet. You actually see surface water. You can also have a, um, an area can have a high water table. So basically if you dig a hole and the water starts coming up, up, up out the ground, that can mean there's a high water table. There is various signs for hydrology. Vegetation is a little bit more difficult. It's either you know your plants or you don't, but identifying vegetation has been made easier due to technology and there's books, but sometimes it does take a little bit longer. If we don't know what a certain um, plant is, we will take it back and we identify it in the office. So I'm going to give you guys a few pros and cons of my job. So one of the pros slash cons is travel. And you're going to go, why is travel a con? And then, you know, it's, I'm getting there. So the pros of travel are that you get to go out and kind of see places you probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to see had you been working in an office. So getting out of the office and getting into new places is super fun. I feel like I've gotten to rediscover my beautiful state of Virginia. Uh, in this role, I've gone to the western side of the state more than I have uh, in the past. I used to go to Blacksburg a lot for Virginia Tech, the Hokies, um, to go to their games, but I never really got to experience the Roanoke area. And um, I've also gotten to go to some other projects that take me out to the Tidewater area. So it's really fun to just kind of see the dynamic of Virginia and how awesome it is to be on the East Coast. So travel is a con because it can kind of be thrown on you. Um, someone can come up and be like, you're going in the field tomorrow. And you're just like, okay, I had a dentist appointment, but I guess now I don't. Um, so that that's one of the downsides of traveling. It, it's really good if you're like me, I don't have any responsibilities. Like I have a dog, but I also live at home. So my parents can help take care of him. Um, it, but it becomes more difficult when like you own an apartment and it makes no sense that you're in the fields like three weeks a month and you're paying rent every month. Um, it, it just can be an inconvenience in that sense. It's been really hard to plan things ahead of time, um, like dentist appointments or, or certain other appointments that leads me into my next con. Um, for me, this may be a me thing and, and um, it might be uh, an issue for other people of color who work in the field. So my hair is natural. Um, obviously. And so I try to take really good care of my hair. And so when I'm in the field every other day, I, I wash my hair every day I'm in the field. I mean, I'm out with ticks and other stuff and it gets in my hair. So for black people, and maybe I'll just speak for me, for me, um, I have highly porous hair. So my hair dries out really quickly. So if I'm washing my hair every day, it's not great for my hair. So that's a con. Um, adding into that con, sometimes I want to look pretty. I can be a tomboy, but sometimes I do want to look pretty. And with someone telling me I'm going into the field the next day, potentially, I'm not going to pay someone $60 to do my hair for me to mess it up the next day. So field work is just extra difficult for me because of that, because it's hard to take care of my hair. But that's just me. Moving on. So another pro is specifically to environmental consulting and consulting in general, I would highly recommend if you're a college student and you don't exactly know what you want to do, you want to get into consulting of like, any kind that's in the general area of what you want to do. So I came in um, into environmental consulting. I have no uh, education in environmental science. I will let you guys know that now. I majored in biology in undergrad. So I studied like microbes and parasites and chronobiology. I, I was not studying environmental science in college. I was studying everything else but environmental science in college. I took an ecology class, but it was like an under level class. So it's, it's, it, it hasn't really been super relevant in what I do. When I was looking for jobs, people kept recommending to me that because I didn't know what to do, they were like, ah, oh, well, look into consulting. And I recommend it now because I do so many things, like I said earlier, that it helps you identify things that you're good at and um, you can start picking out things that you like and things that you don't like, and you can choose to keep down that path, but you still win because you have all these different experiences. So if you're currently in college, especially, get an internship, get an internship somewhere and just get the work experience. So the final pro I have, even though I've only had like two cons for you guys, so this is kind of weighted obviously, but the final pro that I have for you guys is not sitting at a desk all day. I enjoy what I do because I don't have to sit at a desk all the time. I go into the field at least once a week, every week. And since the pandemic, going into the field has been the one normal thing 
in my life. You get to go out and feel free. Um, I've never been hiking before. Field work had to grow on me. When I first started working, I started in the summer. So we were doing field work all the time and it was like 110 degrees outside. I like it hot, so personally I was less bothered by the sun than I was by insects, but it still, it still was better than being at the desk. Sometimes I'm getting cut up by briars and freaking out over ticks crawling all over me, but it's still better than being in the office, personally. I feel like my role has really uh, given me an appreciation for nature. I started hiking and running after I started this job. One, because I want to keep up my physical health because I need to physically perform well in the field, but also I think I've just noticed there's a lot more beauty in the world than I did before. Um, there's something about just kind of walking around the woods and you'll see like a deer shed or actual deer, um, turtles and lizards, and you see all of these things and you just kind of take a moment and it's just you in the middle of the woods and you hear the wind blowing and you just take it all in and it's beautiful. I'm feeling all extra sentimental right now. Um, don't take me too seriously. Um, but I, I do love that. I do love that instead of sitting in an office and artificial lighting, which I hate, and being tired and like coffee, caffeine, hungover and whatever, it's just nice to be outside and just experiencing life for what it is. So that's why I'd recommend this kind of work. You should at least work in the field, I guess, once in your life.